Um, so, so welcome to group one of our summer 2006 student exit presentations for the Autonomy Incubator. Uh, Lauren Howe is with us for her second semester. She was with us last summer where she started work on spline trajectory generation and um, is with us again this summer where she's taken that idea a step further. Uh, Lauren's from the University of Alabama and so please welcome Lauren Howell. Okay, so like Danette said, my name is Lauren Howell. I'm from the University of Alabama and I'm a rising senior. Um, I study aerospace and mechanical engineering and I'm an intern at the Autonomy Incubator. And today I will be talking to you about risk assessment with trajectory generation. So Jeremy mentioned a little bit earlier about the agile approach that we take here at the Autonomy Incubator. And so I also have an example of what one of our sprint charts would have looked like. Uh, this particular chart is what my chart would have been if I had sprinted this week. So this is my final sprint chart. Um, I won't go through all the specific details because all the information in it is covered throughout my presentation. But this is uh, just where my objectives would be listed, the approach, the milestones for the summer, and then I'm sure that this photo also looks familiar to you as well and you will see it again. So my objective for the summer was to implement C2 Bezier splines to create UAV coordinated trajectory while avoiding collision and assessing the environment to optimize for a low risk trajectory. So first I'm going to give you a little bit of background information on the Autonomy Incubator so that you can understand the motivation behind this objective and then how it ties into the larger picture of the work that we are performing. So obviously in this picture you can see we have a lot of different things going on at the Autonomy Incubator. Their technical focus is bringing safe, reliable, resilient, um, and manipulation into a dynamic, unstructured, and data-deprived environment. So basically what that means is we are trying to bring unmanned aerial vehicles into an environment where if they're deprived of information like GPS coordinates or maybe the environment is changing consistently or your data is outdated, then they are still autonomous enough to be able to operate. So you can see all of the different aspects that we have going into all of this. And my part sort of marries the natural human interaction with the collaborative um, trajectory generation. So this is just basically an outline of what I will be presenting through the day. Um, I'll talk a little bit about what my work consisted of last year and how that sets the stage for uh, the building that I did on the, this year. And then I will also give you a little layout of the Holy Grail. And then I'll talk about my part in that, show you a video of our demo, um, what I hope to do going forward, and then some of the conclusionary lessons, highlights, and then the conclusion. So what I was presented with last summer as the challenge is drones overshooting their waypoints and how we can assess this problem and then solve it. So a lot of times whenever you have a drone and it's flying to a waypoint according to its autopilot, a couple of things can happen. It will either overshoot its waypoint in an attempt to turn to go towards its secondary waypoint and thus overshoot its trajectory and then deviate from its specified path or perhaps it will hover over its waypoint so that it can turn and head in the next direction. So this happens a lot whenever we have trajectories that are just point to point, just straight lines. And so the solution to then this is to create trajectories using smooth, flyable curves, and that comes in the form of Bezier splines. So what is a Bezier curve? Um, it's just a big mathematical scary word that means a polynomial function that acts as a function of its control points. So you can see here that this is the big long formula for it, but imagine that these blue dots represent waypoints in space and you're trying to go through all of those waypoints with a curve. So all of the curves that connect them are made up of Bezier splines, but as you can see they're all shaped completely different. And that is because they act as a function of their control points. So basically that means where you place the control points controls the shape of the curve. Bezier splines have a lot of advantages to them, one of them being that they are continuous along all points of the curve and that is because they are a polynomial function. Secondly, it's really, really easy to control the shape of the curve because of their control point placement. And third, you know that your trajectory will go through the waypoints so you know what your trajectory will look like in the end. Last year, I dealt with Bezier curves that had four control points and C1 continuity. C0 continuity means that you have um, continuous position 
C1 continuity guarantees that the derivative at the joints will be continuous, which means it's continuous in velocity. So this is just to show you the difference between a waypoint and a control point. The ones that are in yellow represent the waypoints, and you can see the trajectory goes through them. But then the ones in gray are the control points, which as you can see, the curve is interpolated between them, and so therefore it controls the shape. Um, I spoke to you a little bit earlier about what C1 continuity means. Um, but then we asked the question, well, what can we do to increase the continuity? So this year I worked a lot with Pythagorean hodographs, and they have C2 continuity, which means that they are continuous to the second derivative or continuous in acceleration at the joints. The definition of it is a curve can be considered a Pythagorean hodograph if um, it's the square root of its arc length can still be expressed as a closed closed loop solution or an algebraic expression, or in this case, it would be a polynomial expression. So here I've listed some of the steps to finding a Pythagorean hodograph. It's quite a bit mathematically and computationally a lot more difficult than the Bezier splines that I was working with last semester, because these have 10 control points rather than four. That gives you the added continuity. So you can initialize it with the parameters of your initial position, final position, initial velocity, final velocity, and your initial and final accelerations. Then you can use quaternions to calculate the pre-images, and then you can calculate the hodograph points through these steps. Um, all of this is listed in a paper, which I can give you later, but the mathematics are very rigorous. Um, and then finally, you can calculate the control points of the curve uh, the advantage of this is that both the hodograph and the curve can be represented by Bezier curves, which allows us to retain all the information about the curve as we move forward with our algorithms instead of losing some of the information about the curve if we just had to sample it. So some of the advantages of this is you can use quaternion operations, which are really easy to work with once you understand quaternions and their functions can be used over and over and over again. It has four free parameters, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, it has C2 continuity, as I mentioned earlier. It has easy algorithmic applications because it uh, can be expressed through its Bezier control points. And it has more than one solution. So this allows us to take a look into the four free parameter expressions and see what kind of curve we would want and optimize for the best trajectory. As you can see here, these are three completely different looking curves which are all solutions to one problem. They both connect the same two endpoints, but because of the four free, free parameters, you can vary them and end up with very different looking shaped curves. Some of the things that we're looking to avoid are these cusps that you see here. So that's an example of some solutions that we would want to throw out and not consider. And then the rest you can optimize according to what you would want for your particular trajectory. So now I wanna talk about a little bit of the motivation for the Holy Grail. Imagine that you are a scientist out in a field and you can see before you where you want to define your trajectory, but you don't necessarily have the skills to be able to pilot a drone. One of the big things is the push of emerging technology. We have bigger, better, faster, stronger, but what about more intuitive? What about more safe? And so that's where we want to step in and like really fill those gaps. So we have out of sight missions. One of the users is standing here, but where they need to fly is on the other side of the mountain and they can't see it. Um, what if you have a non-expert drone user? Like a scientist wouldn't necessarily also be an expert drone pilot. Uh, so we need more intuitive mission planning and visualization and real-time mission adjustment for these types of applications. So that's where the holy grail comes in. And as Jeremy mentioned earlier, the flow of information would look a little something like this. You have the user interface where you have the combination of the gesture and speech entering into the interpretation node who will put those pieces of information together and send it to the trajectory generation and risk assessment. And that would enter into a feedback loop with the virtual reality for either confirmation of the trajectory or real-time adjustment of that trajectory. And that would continuously feed back and forth until the user specified, yes, that is the trajectory that I want to fly, in which case, then we would proceed into the flight. So my part was the trajectory generation and risk assessment. So what if I am looking at a map of Langley and I want to identify, okay, well, I want to fly from the autonomy incubator all the way back here to the back 40. 
clearly the fastest path would be in a straight line. But what if there are some places in the way that we don't want to fly over? Clearly the straight line thing is not going to work anymore. But it's very difficult to understand this from a non-drone pilot user. So how do we even go about defining a trajectory? What if there are some places that are a lot more dangerous to fly than others? But then other places that, although it's risky, we're okay with flying over it. The question then becomes, how do we find a path that is safe? So the potential fields function helps to deal with this a lot. You can see that the red areas are marked unsafe and the blue areas are marked safe. Down here in the corner, you can see what that potential fields function looks like. It is a function of the distance to those zones which we consider to be unsafe. So you can define the zones with a convex hull and then we perform calculations to find the distance to that in every point in the field. Depending on how far away you are from that, it is then assigned a risk value, which is then, of course, represented colorfully on the map. Um, here you can see that you can scale the gradient steepness with the beta variable here, and then D represents the distance, and then, of course, there would be some recognized distance away that you would consider to be safe, that it would be considered out of scope from your worries of flying into. So this is the 2G projected map over Langley, which you just saw. And then here is what the MATLAB window comes up with overlaid, and you can see that the risk is represented in the Z direction in this case. But it is also possible to calculate a three-dimensional risk assessment for different heights being different risk levels as well. Then we move forward into the collision checking algorithms, which Javier will go into much more detail in later. But basically what this does is obstacles and dangerous areas are represented as convex polytopes. And then you can calculate the um, distance to them and check for a collision using uh, GJK algorithms and proximity queries. And then this also allows for coordinated flight. Using these, we have a guaranteed safe flight that you won't run into anything and you won't fly over any areas that you don't want to be in. So finally, we have the safe trajectory overlaid into the environment and also represented. So this is a very nice intuitive feedback to the user to show them that yes, their trajectory goes where it wants it to and yes, it is safe. It is avoiding the areas that you specified for it to avoid. So this is a really good sort of first step in validation before they move into the virtual reality and see it in three dimensions actually acted out before them. So this is a video of the Holy Grail demo debut which was the first time we performed it. And here you can see the user is specifying the path with her gestures and her voice recognition. And it's popping up, hey, here's the trajectory that you gave me. And this is what the risk of the environment looks like. And then this, of course, is just me explaining how that is all calculated. And then as you saw, Jeremy is our interpreter guy. So he is splicing the information together. And here you can see the user is using a headset and back here you can see she is watching in the virtual reality a simulation of the flight happening. And then after the user sends the OK, then we take off and the drone flies a scaled down path in this case um, of what the actual trajectory was. So this was a wonderful way for the incubator to showcase the capabilities of the Holy Grail and exactly where we can go with it. So that opened the door to demo after demo after demo. And so a lot of the summer was a lot of demo prep, which was definitely a lot of fun, but it also involved some adventuring here. So you can see how happy we were after we had our first success, which just led to many more successes after that. So what do we do looking forward? Um, some of the things that I would like to do is to create a more detailed map of the center, which I have been working on this week. We would also like to actually fly a real scale version of this mission outside, which is also in the works. Um, I'm also interested in creating a user interface for easily defining obstacles and areas that are risky, because right now it is a very slow, very painful process, and I would like it to be something that is speedy so that missions can be completed very quickly. Um, I would also like to create a full cost function library for new optimizations for things like time and energy or anything else that you might like to optimize your trajectory for. So this past week and things I would like to continue with, I've been working on translating lat, long, and height coordinates down into local northeast and down coordinates, which has just been an adventure. 
Um, and here you can see this is a more detailed map of the area of Langley. Um, the autonomy incubator is right here. This is the gym. This is the gantry. And so you can see all of these shapes represent the convex holes of the areas, the trees, the roads, basically anything that you can think of in this area. And we have them defined in three dimensions so that we can do collision checking in both 2D and 3D and risk assessment in both 2D and 3D. So some of the lessons that I learned this summer, uh, I learned how to use MATLAB and how to format that and syntax it and how it's different than C++, which is what I'm primarily used to working with, and then how to plot in that for validation. I learned how to work with DDS, which Jeremy talked about a lot earlier, how to write readers and how to write writers, um, and then how to integrate that with MATLAB. <coughs> I also learned how to use AR drone commands in Simulink, and I learned a bunch of mathematical concepts, which thanks to Javier for being the world's greatest math teacher. I learned how to use Pythagorean hodographs, quaternions, and their operations, Bezier's curve operations, the GJK algorithm, and proximity queries, and then the translation of global coordinates into local coordinates. So some of the highlights for the summer, because today is my last day and I'm feeling sentimental. <laughs> um, so, while I was first here, I befriended the entire IT staff of the NASA Help Desk, which is based out of New Orleans, so I got into some very interesting and fun conversations with them. Um, I attended the AIAA conference um, for aviation, which was a lot of fun several weeks ago. Um, I disappeared to Europe for a week, and I represented NASA, and everybody just thought NASA was the coolest thing ever, because it is. <laughs> Um, and then, of course, there was the great incubator flood of 2016, which if you weren't here, oh my gosh. <laughs> that was just wonderful, because of all the buildings that could flood, it would be the one where we keep drones on the floor. Um, and then, lastly, and most wonderfully, I became a pirate for a while. And I was lovingly known as Risky McPegleg because I hauled it around like a pirate with a wooden leg. <laughs> so, in conclusion, I would like to thank um, Danette for being the world's greatest mentor, Javier for being the world's greatest teacher and being super patient with me as I interrupted his day and asked a billion questions, um, Anna for all the help that she did, my incredible and supportive Holy Grail team, um, Liz Ward who uh, helped support me in her grant, and then of course all of the autonomy incubator term interns and the PIs. Um, so I will now take any questions that anyone has and thank you so much for your attention. So looking at the at the potential function side, um, can you explain more or less how do you, how did you come up with that expression? Yes. So Javier asked the question about the potential fields function, how it was developed, and why it is the function that it is. And so I'll go back to it here really quickly. So the risk is a function of the distance. And so I did a lot of reading on what a potential fields function was because before this summer I'd never heard of it. And so I knew that I wanted the risk to go from zero to one. And so I was looking into things that would increase exponentially the closer that you got to the function I wanted it to reach one. And so the first thing that came to my head was e to some negative power. And so I came up with e to the negative d, but then there are certain things that happened to where we needed the derivative to be equal to certain things as well, and we also wanted to include uh, a certain distance away from it that it would be considered safe, so at that point the risk would be equal to zero. Um, and then of course in order to get the function to be equal to zero and one at both ends, we needed the factor of k and alpha which we solved for accordingly, knowing what it would have to equal at d max and knowing what it would equal at distance is equal to zero. And then we also wanted to be able to control the gradient of how quickly the risk increased the closer that you got, so we added the scaling factor of beta. And so that's sort of how the algorithm itself grew to fruition. Does that answer your question? Are there any other questions? Kevin, the question is basically, how does a vehicle really understand the difference between a curve that is C1 and C2? How does it track that when in, in real life things are C infinity? And so basically the biggest difference comes between 
the joints. Actually, those are the pictures though. This comes between the joints. So this is just one curve, but the, the hardest thing to do is to join the curves together. And so the continuity comes at the joints of the curves whenever, because it's a piecewise function. And so you can have curves that are coming in this direction and then go this way. So what the drone would see is a sharp turn, and that is not a smooth, flyable path because the derivatives are not the same. They may be equal in position, they end at the same place and they start at the same place, but all of a sudden you're going completely tangent from the direction that you were going originally or the curvature isn't the same. And so in that case, the behavior of the drone and the reaction to the drone of <coughs> flying from one curve into another would create some sort of jerk or some sort of change, but it would not be smooth, it wouldn't be as flyable, it would have some sort of reaction that wouldn't be ideal. So in this situation, it would be continuous in velocity, so you wouldn't have it suddenly changing velocity or trying to go a completely different direction than it was originally going. And so the higher continuity that you have, the more agreement that you have at those joints, and the more smooth and flyable the trajectory is. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. So let's follow up on that question. So you could calculate anything to C infinity, right? If it's a continuous curve, but that's right. not what we have. Right. Right. And we actually need to make these calculations in real time. And so that's a trade. It's a trade space, right? Uh, between continuity and computation time and our requirements. Right. Right. So let's suppose we had the world's most powerful computer and we could calculate to C infinity, right? So that's not a problem. Okay. Why wouldn't we do that? What well, happens with the control points? What happens right with the complexity right. and the way we're able to think about and interact with something like this? Right. So it is not intuitively very easy to know where you have to place the control points in order to get the type of curve that you're looking for or the shape of the curve. Whenever you break beyond C1 continuity, you're entering into C2 continuity. And when <laughs> That, that loses the independence of the control points. The control points become more dependent on the placement of the other ones. So if you wanted to move one control point, then all of a sudden your entire trajectory changes. And so beyond that, it becomes a lot more mathematically and computationally difficult to do any sort of real-time changes to the curve or to even abstract your trajectory enough to be able to come up with a way to place the control points because then you're coming up with, you know, 100 control points, 200 control points, and that gets very, very, very computationally expensive. Thank you, Lauren.